You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Just a heads up, this episode is brought to you by the Script Summit Screenplay Contest, where you can win a cash prize or even a contract with a Hollywood talent manager. All you have to do is visit scriptsummit.com for more info. All right, welcome to the Successful Screenwriter Podcast. On this episode, I am joined by a guest host as we analyze and break down a film to discover what works and what doesn't. Real quick before we get started, I wanted to mention that we are celebrating our one-year anniversary of the Successful Screenwriter Podcast with a huge giveaway. This is awesome. We have a ton of prizes for you from mentorships to swag, and you can enter it absolutely for free. All you have to do is visit the Successful Screenwriter Facebook page and click on the giveaway tab or go to the successfulscreenwriter.com slash podcast. Now, you can enter multiple times too, but keep an ear out this episode for the secret code, which you can get five free entries with. Now, on to our show. All right, welcome to the podcast. We have on a really cool guest today. We have on a producer, screenwriter, production manager. He has worked on Netflix films such as Yasuke and the Pacific Rim Black. He's also done Eagle Talent versus DC Superheroes. We have on Vincent Imaoka. Vincent, thanks for being on. Hey, Jeffrey. Thanks for having me, man. This, uh, I've been looking forward to this. Um, this is so cool. We're going to talk about some animated films and talk about the the, the unique style of of writing for animation, which is which is different from your traditional Western features. I mean, then also I know you've got a producer and screenwriting background, so we're going to just kind of pick your brain a little bit. Um, before we get in there, though, I really want to get like, what is your origin story? What brought us into what you do? For sure, yeah. Um, well, I grew up over here in Los Angeles, where I'm currently based right now. Uh, but after I graduated from UCLA, I ended up moving over to Tokyo. Um, you know, my passion has always been in anime and the business over there. Um, so I ended up doing my MBA over there. But after that, uh, in pure luck, I, I met a CEO of a company called DLE. Um, okay. And they were an entertainment company that did anime and uh, live action shows and live action movies. Um, but, you know, he invited me over sort of uh, shadow under him and be his apprentice. And from there, uh, I got a assistant producer job working on some of their domestic titles, um, like uh, Eagle Talent that you just mentioned, or another one that I worked on is called Pompica Pants, which uh, I don't know if you know the group uh, Flipside. Um, they are a music group, but the main vocals of that group. Her name is uh, Nanjo Yoshino. Uh, she was the main uh, actress on that show that I worked on. So that was oh, really wow. fun. Um, but yeah, I did that for about uh, two, three years or so over in Tokyo. Um, after that, I actually uh, switched careers a little bit and ended up joining Hasbro um, as their toy acquisitions person working with their entertainment brands. So even over there, I worked with a lot of their entertainment properties, like the uh, latest My Little Pony movie that's coming out. Um, I, I had a little bit of hands in that. Awesome. Uh, worked on a little bit of the script over with uh, Stephen Davis, who was the uh, president of Haswell well Studios at the time. Um, and of course, working with Transformers, um, uh, especially War for Cybertron that came out of Netflix and some of the animation properties going on over there. Oh, wow. um, but after that, I ended up joining uh, Netflix after getting poached by them. Uh, as you just mentioned, I worked on Pacific Rim the Black um, and Yasuke as, um, as production managers. Um, and a couple of other projects that are going to be coming out that can't be talked about yet. But, um, you know, <laughs> once they start hitting, uh, you'll start seeing my name up a little bit more. That's awesome. um, but yeah, I mean, that's my quick background of where I came from, both rooted in uh, Japanese anime and uh, Western properties. Yeah. So you've worked on some pretty huge properties. What draws you towards a particular property is it is it just like i you know you love uh dc superheroes or that type of animation and so you're like i want to work on that property or is there something story-wise that draws you to it you know it's a little bit of both you know i myself am a big fan i'm a huge pop culture nerd as well so um over at eagle talent and dc superheroes that's exactly what you said it's like you know i've been a dc fan since i was a little kid i wanted to work on the property so once that uh, the negotiation started working between the um, Warner Brothers Japan and our CEO yeah. back then. 
um, that was a project that sort of came over to me as, you know, the DC aficionado in the house. Um, <laughs> so that, you know, one, once again, that's one of those projects where it's like, you know, I had a lot of knowledge behind it and I could put a lot of it into script work and work with the script writers and saying, okay, this is where, how the DC superheroes work and this is their DNA. So um, yeah. a lot of other projects that I've done that it's having a background for like, you know, Pacific Rim, I was a big fan of the franchise and Guillermo del Toro and everything that Legendary yeah. Pictures was doing. So it's sort of bringing that knowledge into the script writing process and the creators that I work with there. So what I'm hearing is that it pays off to be a fan and incredibly knowledgeable of a particular property. I think of like Dave Filoni in Star Wars. Yeah. And he is essentially like, you know, inheriting that franchise. And so I think there is something to be said to having this, this uncanny ability to truly know the core of all these characters and to be a fan of them and to work on it I think it really kind of allows you to bring that passion into a project for sure you're 100 right on like being that fan and being a walking encyclopedia um to be honest not a lot of people have that knowledge um you know Kevin Feige the reason he got to the head of Marvel is because you know he was working on the X-Men films and yeah. Uh, like Brian Singer was going to him because he was a huge Marvel fan and now he drives all of Marvel because he, <laughs> he's just a really big fan. Yeah, it's true. It's pretty amazing. So I actually just finished binge watching Pacific Rim Black as prepping nice. for part of this, this interview. And it was really cool. Um, it went in a completely different direction. Spoilers, guys, but it's the show. So um, it went in a totally different direction talking about like hybrid kaiju and Jaegers and things like that. Um, and I know you kind of came from a producer aspect on that show. So what was your take on it? Uh, well, my take was definitely, you know, working with Legendary to see what their original take on it was first and the way that they wanted to sort of bring the story. Yeah. Um, and then my end would sort of be like, okay, how do we translate that over into animation and working with, you know, Polygon Pictures, which was doing the CG animation for us. Um, and trying to see, you know, how do I act as the connection point between the ideas that Polygon Pictures has and the ideas that Legendary has along with the ideas that I have. Right. Um, so, you know, up to this point where, you know, Pacific Rim 2, the movie sort of veered away from Pacific Rim 1 right. and Legendary wanted to drive that in a specific way and the ideas that they had and trying to see how we could bring that into a global point of like, okay, you know, everyone's fans of Pacific Rim 1, right. everyone's fans of Pacific Rim 2, but how do we set ourselves apart from that in terms of our storytelling, you know, taking the the siblings, uh, oh, you know, and, and making it their story rather than be like, okay, this is a story of what the movies were doing. So we right. really differentiate, differentiate ourselves from what uh, the movies were and trying to find that new base audience of what Pacific Rim could be. I think it was really cool. I think it was intelligent storytelling because when I was looking at it, you know, it would have been very easy to to do things like pull from the central characters or, right. or have um, little cookies here or there, or Easter eggs of the central characters. But instead, what you guys did was you pulled from uh, supporting characters of the other films. And I thought that was fascinating because then that really is for the fans, people that are familiar with the franchise. Go, oh yeah, I know who, who Hans was. And oh, he's, you know, he's, he's ghost linking with him and all that cool stuff like that. So I thought that was, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like we took a lot of like the key elements that were present in one and two, uh, like Hans or how they would be able to ghost link with the Kaiju. And then it's yeah. like, okay, how do we, uh, uh, evolve upon that, especially as you know, it's a yeah. couple of years after the second movie. So it's like, where has the technology evolved since, and why are the kaiju still attacking us, and why are the Jaeger programs still uh, necessary for the world? And trying to figure out that evolution of story to say, okay, this is where the franchise is right. going to go from now on. Yeah, I thought it was cool. And then you guys built in the AI. And what I liked is made the AI its own character. She had her own yeah. personality. And um, it was it kind of reminded me of uh, of Hitchhiker's, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because she's a little down. She's a little depressed. Yeah. Um, and so I thought it was a lot of fun. But um, so writing for animation, and I know I know you've done some ghost writing and some, some screenwriting on your own. Um, I always find that an anime style of writing is different from more of a Western style. I actually want to pick your brain on this a little bit and, and see what you think. And, and if you disagree, totally fine. But I find that in an anime style, 
they like to kind of start you out in the in the story where things are happening and you're a little lost and confused and then they work that towards the midpoint where you get a lot of explanation a lot of backstory on the stories where it's very different with western with, with our side you, you kind of start with the character from the beginning and then you get to the middle and and they have a big down moment but i, I find it's kind of different i want to get your take on what you think about that no, I think you're definitely spot on there. For uh, Western stories, it's all it's about the origin story. It's like, where do these main characters come from? And, you know, what are their past motivations? Whereas for anime, uh, anime viewers really like to get dropped into the action. I think that's right. like the main part of anime. It's like, okay, where's the action at? What is the world that's already been established? Especially for uh, a lot of anime titles, you really only have, you know, 12 episodes or so to... Uh, tell your story and you don't know if you'll get a season two you know if you're really successful you will but if not you want to make sure that your story is self-contained within those 12 episodes um, so it's trying to find that point of you know where do we want to drop the people into the story because if you go into a lot of backstory then you're probably going to end up spending half the season on that backstory and then right. you have half a season to then you know try to figure out the solution and you don't really want to leave on a huge cliffhanger if you're not going to get a season two yeah um that's interesting yeah. so so they're working on the fact that they're not banking on the fact that they might get an additional season so they want to drop you into the heat kind of get you interested in the action grab you there and then use the backstories themselves as what i would call mysteries um and then and then investing you into the character so now you want to stick around to find out um you know exactly what happened right like attack on titan i think was what when they did that show you're going okay what is going on with these characters now i have to wait around for six episodes right and then you have the big reveal so i think it's a really interesting thing i think you're absolutely right i think in the Western, we really are about the origin story and then the growth of that character. So it is fascinating if you're out there and you're thinking of trying to write for a type of an anime, it is a different outlook. I think the structure is the same, but it's a different approach to that structure, which I think is it's, it's quite fascinating. For sure, yeah. And I think for anime titles also, a lot of them are based upon manga comics that have pre-existed already. Right. So, you know, it's sort of taking a look at that also and see what the original manga have done and seeing, you know, what parts of the story you want to adapt over to anime also. So it's a lot of uh, a juggling in terms of if there is a pre-existing story and, you know, what percentage of that you want to turn into anime and what percentage right. of it will be original. Manga comics are so crazy with... <laughs> the plot lines and 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 all of the different types of stories that they have that i i think it would be a nightmare to try and really adapt a manga comic into a feature film because you, they they build such big worlds and they go really far with them um and so i i just i haven't i haven't attempted to do that yet but i'm sure this is something that you've been thinking about for sure, yeah, and like we we haven't seen too much success, you know, taking anime or manga and then putting them into a live action uh, realm, as you know, as obviously everyone has seen, right? Um, like Ghost in the Shell and stuff like, like that. Like Ghost in the Shell, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I would say like probably the the one that I think is a big success is uh, Edge of Tomorrow with Tom Cruise. Um, based upon All You Need Is Kill, which was a light novel. I did a, not a realize series. that was based on a manga. On, that's wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great. That's a great. Um, <clears throat> that's a great film. I actually, really quite enjoyed it. It was under. It I was undersold too. and it was undermarketed, and I think that's yeah. why it didn't do as well. But I mean, I sat down and I was thrilled with that film. Well, that's a great example. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like um, uh, a lot of these movies, you know, they would uh, Hollywood movies would take a lot of the backstory of what the original manga or original Japanese source material did and then would try to evolve it. I think, you know, um, uh, Edge of Tomorrow is a perfect example of, hey, we have this story, but let's adapt it towards the Western audience and put a little bit of originality in it. Um, so that that sense of uh, adaptation and and uh, localization, I think, like, yeah. Edge of Tomorrow is really one of the only ones that really hit it like perfectly on the spot. Do you do you feel there's a market for adapting manga comics into live action, or do you think it's just better to stick with the anime route? No, I think there is definitely a huge market. I think the market is actually booming right now. Netflix oh. recently announced uh, they're adapting Gundam into a live action really? uh, movie. Yeah. Wow. Um, and obviously they they did like Death Note uh, a couple years back in live action too. But I think Hollywood is sort of looking into anime 
uh, storytelling right now because it's such a rich realm of different IPs and different characters. Yeah. Um, it's perfect for them to sort of adapt into the Western audience. Well, that's what I want to ask you. It's kind of you kind of taking me to where I wanted to go. Thank you for that. So, I because I look at um, uh, patterns, right? And so, you know, in the '80s and the '90s, we had big, buffed, you know, action heroes. That was the thing. Mm -hmm. The 2000s came around. Superheroes kind of changed the whole game and you lost all those those old action heroes and superheroes became the new action heroes now we've been doing superheroes for quite a while now and i and i feel that eventually we're going to be pulling away from that genre as as big as the mcu is i think it's going to get a little played out i think what you're going to end up happening you're going to see more and more television less and less films or at least more sparsed out so then i start wondering okay where is it going next? And as you're saying, like with the Death Note, and, and I, I think there's been a few others on Netflix as mm -hmm. well, going into features, perhaps that's the future. Perhaps we're going to see a lot more adaptations from manga going into the Hollywood system. Yeah, I would say that that's probably spot on also, even for like, you know, the MCU and moving away from theaters, you know, they're, they're hitting it big on Disney Plus with like WandaVision yeah. and uh, Winter Soldier and Captain America. Um, so yeah, it, I think we're going to see a lot more adaptations coming out within the coming years of famous anime properties that are getting translated over to the Western live action audience. Awesome. Um, and, and it, it'll be time seen in terms of, you know, whether they will be successful or not. Yeah. I think it's cool that there's a market there and they're tapping into it. I'm really interested to see what happens. I did watch Death Note. I actually quite enjoyed it. Uh, it's pretty hard to not enjoy Willem Dafoe playing a, <laughs> playing a demon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love so, his voice. <laughs> yeah. It's so great. Yeah. It's really good. So, and, and they, and they're setting these things up for sequels. So they're trying to see like, okay, if this is going to work out, um, they, they have a place to go, which is, which is kind of cool. So what do you, I know you can't talk about any projects right now that are coming out, but is there any projects you've worked on that you've taken something away from that you think would be really great for the audience to hear? Um, good question. I mean, uh, sort of going back to some of my first projects over at DLE, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the big takeaway there, you know, starting off in the anime industry as a foreigner, um, I want everyone to know that sort of like across the world right now, here in the US or anywhere else, I'm trying to figure out how they could get into anime. Um, the anime industry is becoming a lot more diverse now. Um, oh. There's a lot more Western people that sort of going into anime. Um, uh, for example, Justin Leach, who is a producer here in the US, he just got his anime called Eden released over on Netflix. Um, and he's deep into the anime industry over there as well. So like, um, you know, don't be discouraged in terms of being a foreigner and thinking that you don't have a way to get into the anime industry. Um, the anime industry themselves, they're looking for a lot of foreign talent right now. So um, like oh. my takeaway is saying that you could be a, an American screenwriter and there are ways to get into anime screenwriting as well. Oh, that's awesome. That's wonderful. And it sounds like for, for your way of breaking in was through networking. I mean, yeah. you said that you had, you had run into somebody and then that opened doors. And I appreciate networking regularly. I think that it is, it is the best way. I know there are other ways people love to query and things like that. But I think really building out your network and providing a sense of value can really take you into the next step, hopefully. Um, well, well, that's fantastic. Is there any projects or, or anything coming out right now that, that uh, you can discuss? Um, let me think. I mean, <laughs> uh, we have Transformers hitting in July uh, that you know we've already announced. Um, Is that a show or a? Or a, a uh, yeah, feature? so it's the final uh, War for Cybertron trilogy. Uh, it's called Kingdom. Um, so that's going to be coming out. I, I'm not sure. I forget how much we've actually disclosed about it, but you know, we've made the announcement that which platform on Netflix. Netflix. Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. So I that's love, a fun I one because. Cybertron. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that that's a fun one because I came from Hasbro, and obviously being a big Transformers fan, I'd be able to work on the franchise and the show both back at Hasbro and then over at Netflix um that that's one that um i i'm really proud of now being a producer and a writer have you found it easier to be able to give script notes or when working on ghostwriting that you have a, per, a, a a particular perspective that you can bring to the process 
For sure. Yeah. You know, it definitely is easier, you know, being a producer and a writer to sort of give notes back to either the creator or the showrunner or um, anyone else. Um, you're essentially bringing the business mentality of what you think will succeed on the platform and your uh, own personal acumen onto the script writing process. So you're helping to guide any creators in terms of, you know, what, what would be a successful project. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So I think it's, really important to have that balance between the creative background and then the business background. Um, Cause then that's really gonna help, you know, propel a project further and trying to see, you know, what could work and what won't work with the screen. Yeah, I think being a hyphen that can be important. I think, you know, if you have an opportunity to dip your toes into the, produ the producerly realm, um, I say, why not? You know, anything that can make you a better screenwriter is worth it. Now, have you had, and you don't have to dish if you don't want to, but <laughs> have you had any issues with egos on these larger projects? I know, <laughs> I know smaller projects, you can get a lot of clashing egos. And I was just curious on these larger properties. For sure. I mean, you know, I think your whatever job or whatever project you're going to work on, there's always going to be somebody with egos in there. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not, you know, a, a fault on their end. Also, you know, sometimes they need the ego to push what they think creatively forward. Oh. Um, so it's trying to find that balance of like, okay, if you do meet some of uh, uh, an ego, you know, quote unquote ego, uh, <laughs> I, I also want to say that, you know, ego is a negative term in any way. Um, but, you know, it's trying to find that balance of working with someone who's uh, a little bit more straightforward in t versus somebody else that's on the same project or, you know, uh, uh, across a different company that yeah. you know, uh, may clash with that a little bit. So, you know, not dishing too much, but sounds I'll say like, there's plenty of that now. Sounds there. like somebody's a little pragmatic. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's funny. Well, I could tell you from my own perspective, I've I've used Eagle as, as a tool, but not towards other people. If I have a hard time breaking a story, I'll have somebody challenge me that I can't do it. And then all of a sudden I'm fueled with this energy and I sit down and I start clacking on those keys. Yeah. Um, so no, I really appreciate your time, Vincent. I think this was great really getting to dish about anime with you and 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 talking about the different types of story notes and and uh and this process in general for sure i mean i really enjoyed this also it's nice meeting you um i hope everybody has learned a little bit more about anime and hopefully we get to see some more talent going into anime out there absolutely all right and and if somebody is trying to really if as you said a foreigner is trying to break in um networking is a way to do it do you recommend any platforms they could use could they use like a linkedin is there something else that that they can try and get out there that brings us to today's secret code which is cybertron make sure to visit the successful screenwriter facebook page and click on the contest giveaway tab and use the code cybertron or go to the successful screenwriter slash podcast now back to the show you know linkedin is definitely good um there's a lot of uh foreign companies out there that are connected to anime that are on linkedin uh japan themselves they don't use linkedin too much so right. um it's really trying to find that foreign person that's then connected back into japan that could sort of help you network through there um so right. linkedin is definitely a, a first start all right very good all right thank you very much sir all right. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share in your social media where you can tag us at The Successful Screenwriter.